come and tell Sunni, no, you have been excluded. So therefore, you should now start fighting against the incumbent uh, Shia government. So uh, it happens everywhere. Uh, if you look at the history of the Sri Lankan <coughs> country, it was that notion that uh, the Tamil were a small group, then the majority assumed power once democracy came into being, and now the minority started to fight the majority. So what is the solution in such highly divided societies? The issue is always one. You advocate for power sharing. So in the same notion, I would urge our military strategists in Somalia to adopt that notion of sharing of power amongst the different clans in Somalia. The, the arguments my colleagues are putting, particularly from the court side, is, is that probably we need to abandon Somalia. No, we can't. We can't afford to abandon Somalia. Uh, what of securing the borders? Well, to me, that is not very effective. Why? One, the border is just too long. That's number one. You would expend a lot of resources trying to secure it, as opposed to a situation where you make an effort probably to build up institutions in Somalia. Number two, we do have also the issue of the sea. Uh, those attacks where uh, ships which were trying to pass through Somalia were being attacked cannot be secured by just securing the border. So because of all those factors, and, and also when you talk about a porous border, you do not even necessarily talk about uh, people coming in or coming out. We do also have other forms of interactions. Mm -hmm. Let's say like uh, the money exchanges. So the, the, my point was that we cannot abandon Somalia because what happens there affects us. And therefore, the point is, uh, because we are inside Somalia, we should now come up with strategies to build up institutions. And political institutions in highly divided societies are usually built by power sharing. Okay. Uh, no, Akala, maybe as we uh, try and wind up and get to <coughs> something else in terms of the way forward. Well, first, I think it's very important um, that we get clarity on this issue. Uh, there seems to be a, a bit of muddying of the issues. You'll remember during the Grand Coalition government, when Yusuf Haji, who is now Senator for Garissa, was the Minister of Defense. He, ma he came to Bunge and he made a proposal and the mission was clear. Creation of a buffer zone, number one, and number two, hot pursuit. Remember that there were some Kenyans who had been kidnapped and taken into Somalia by Al-Shabaab. That was the mission. That's what was presented to the National Assembly. That was what was approved. Thereafter, uh, Moshimiya here said that, you know, Parliament was not in session, therefore, uh, parliamentary approval could not be approved, I mean could not be sought by the administration. The KDF Act is clear that in the event that there is to be any form of military deployment of the KDF, there needs to be parliamentary approval. So I don't understand why the executive in issuing those orders to the KDF to continue their stay in Somalia and to uh, further their incursion towards the port of Kismayu could not seek out parliamentary approval so that when we are having this debate, we know what exactly the mission is. Thereafter, let me differ with him on that withdrawal of the KDF would amount to abandonment of Somalia. There are two ways of intervening in this conflict. There's the military intervention and there's the political intervention. As the good senator here has said, international law actually is against neighboring countries deploying militaries to, uh, to each other, specifically for the reasons that we're seeing. We get military uh, incursions into the neighboring country. You spark nationalist sentiments and all these other negative effects. So rather than having uh, a long, drawn-out military engagement, why can we not engage politically and try to build up the institutions, as is so rightly suggested, through political means? You'll never build governance institutions using the military. Okay. That's my belief. Uh, Senator Beatrice Elachi, maybe your closing comments on this on the way forward. I think my closing comments are very clear that indeed as Kenya, we are in a situation where I said, you <coughs> have your relatives in Northeastern. Mm. You remember when we started the issue of the buffer zone, that we, the, everyone came out in Northeastern uh, not agreeing on even having that buffer zone because they know these are our brothers. So it is for us to sit down and ask ourselves now, since Somali uh, Somali Kenyans we have and Somali Somalis but all of them are cousins that's why we have the Ogaden who are part of Somalia the same way we have even in the borders of Tanzania the Maasai is on this side and this side 
how do we deal with such a situation? And we can't lie to ourselves that coming out of Somalia, you'll have resolved that, no. I believe we need to think as a country and say, we are on a border where people have intermarried, where anyone at any point would want to give the other side information, we'll do that. And they, they have done that, that uh, many times. So for us to move on, how do we help KDF? First of all, to change their strategy where, when I was reading the papers that indeed, when you're coming out of Somalia, the whole team comes out and then a new team comes in. I mean, really, it's, it, it's wrong because you leave yourselves very vulnerable. And I think they were just doing that for the sake of maybe saying, have an opportunity, go for a mission, make money. I think it is time they change their strategy and say, we are here because of one resolution to ensure Somalia gets peace, mm -hmm. to ensure the people of Somalia and Kenya can live in peace. Number two, we need to ask ourselves, as the African Union, now that we have Ethiopia, Burundi, and all of them have gone through this, I mean, at one point, whenever they changed their army, they would be attacked, they would be killed, even Uganda. But then, I think also the African Union has let down the soldiers. Because after all that, they never went back to sit and ask themselves, what do we lack? We don't have capacity, we don't have drones, we don't have airstrikes, we only have the ground strikes. I mean, when you read the whole scenario, you find that these young soldiers are left so vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And yet the seniors will live in Kisimayo. For me, I would want now a strategy where we are asking ourselves, as the African Union, as Kenya, are we able to work with the African Union to support and build capacity for our soldiers? Two, what strategy do you have as you fight Al-Shabaab? How do you ensure the government of Somalia now takes over mm. to ensure that you move on and the country moves on, the country builds itself, builds its army, have capacity, just the way right now Iraq is doing through the support of uh, the, the United States and the whole, and the world should also look at Somalia. It's not just for the East African Horn, because Somalia has one of the best ports, has, I mean, the resources that can potential. come out and the potential to support Somalia, to come out of where they are, 25 to 20, I think 30 years now. Really, we need to ask ourselves, for Kenya, we have no choice but to ensure that country is in peace. Mm. And if it's staying there until they have peace, that's the choice we have, because even if we walk out today, 10 years to come, Somalia will affect Kenya. Ten years to come, let us not lie here. Those counties, Wajia, Mandera, Garissa, can find themselves in a war they have never seen if we do not deal with this now. All right. Um, so, uh, Michael, all said and done, there's something the Kenyan <coughs> KDF is doing wrong in Somalia. It is not a coincidence that the Somali parliament will vote that, the, that the, for the expulsion of the Kenyan troops in Somalia. Second, they have lost public support with respect to the local Somali population. You must interrogate critically your continued usefulness being in Somalia. Thirdly, there are other strategic ways that we can use to ensure that we build a Somalia that is stable and provide security not only to Kenya but to the region. And these strategies must be extend beyond this incursion or this now, this all out, so to speak, as the, the, our colleagues are putting it, all out war. Because f the dynamics of a guerrilla warfare and insurgency is, is, in terms of its structure, has massive, massive human cost and massive suffering. And therefore, a, a strategic retreat in terms of ensuring that it is the Somalis that take up the positions uh, to safeguard their own territorial integrity is, is a mission that will finally see us exit in a manner as to secure the peace and the stability of the Somali people. All right. Thank you very much. I think we'll move on to another <coughs> subject now because uh, we'll also have uh, security experts come and analyze and tell us really what needs to be done. And let's uh, now change focus and look at uh, the election year that we are looking forward to in 2017. And of course, there's a build up to that. And I'll come to you, Noah. And this is in regards to uh, the IEBC. I know the opposition has been very vocal that the IEBC is ill-prepared for the elections. However, with uh, what happened uh, last week with Moses Wetangula being left uh, let off the hook, uh, the opposition again came out and said, yes, that's the right decision. They were in support of IEBC. And the question here is, are you in support of IEBC when the decisions favor the opposition? 
Look, we have been very clear about our stand on the Independent Elections and Boundaries Commission. It's a capacity issue and the ability to manage elections. Um, we were called to a retreat by the IABC about two weeks ago in uh, Naivasha to discuss the elections operations plan. During that retreat, um, for the umpteenth time, I made a request to the IABC Secretariat to provide us with a register of voters from the 2013 elections. To date, they are still not able to produce one single register of voters from the 2013 elections. That tells you a lot about the capacity to manage elections. Further to that, you know that we've been proponents of the Okoa Kenya referendum initiative in Kenya. We gathered one million signatures, presented them to the IABC, as is the requisite, uh, requirement by the Constitution, that if there is to be a referendum petition, you present one million signatures. You saw the announcement by the chief executive officer that CORD did not present these signatures in soft copy, and therefore the IABC is not able to verify whether these signatures are genuine or not. I find that to be preposterous. You know, it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever had in my life, that the IABC now wants political parties to do their work for them. It is up to them to take these one million signatures, convert them to soft copy, or whatever format it is that they require, and verify those signatures. You now have an IABC that's saying it is not able to do that within the three months as stipulated by law. Further to that, when you interrogate the elections operations plan 2015 to 2017, the large number of issues that demonstrate to you that these people are not prepared to conduct elections. They announced in December that they would conduct a mass voter registration exercise that begins February 15th to March 15th. Um, they say that they have a budget of 2 billion shillings for this. They were unable to make the case to the National Assembly and the Senate to get that 2 billion shillings and only ended up with 500 million. This is why they're proposing this ludicrous suggestion that they should only use two BVR kits per ward to register voters. You'll remember one of the, uh, or the hot issues emerging out of the 2013 general election was the disenfranchisement of voters. We had 5 million Kenyans who had national identity cards but were not registered as voters because one, the registration period was too short, two, there were not enough BVR kits. The IBC has 16,600 BVR kits and there are 33,000 polling stations in Kenya. Right now, they plan to deploy uh, plus or minus 2,900 kits and there are 33,000 polling stations in Kenya. How will they register these 5 million people if they only deploy such a paltry amount I mean, how, how can they explain All right, I'll come this? to you on what maybe possibly you think I'd, would be the solutions. And let me come to you, Honorable Kangata, and ask a question, the same question in, in regards to your confidence in IEBC being able to deliver a free and fair elections in 2017. Well, uh, to me, IEBC is a very good institution. It has credible, uh, credible mechanisms to ensure that the election will be free and fair. One, for several reasons. One, uh, we must look at the way IEBC was appointed. IBC was appointed with, with uh, all key political parties playing a key role. Uh, you can recall, to the best of my recollection, I suppose even the chair was really supported by the current uh, leader of the opposition, that is Mr. Raila Odinga. Uh, number two, CORD was given an opportunity to change IBC, but it refused. Of course, that opportunity was given in an indirect manner. How? There was a proposal by the Member of Parliament for Ugenya, that is David Ochieng, to extend the election date. Uh, that date was proposed to come in December next year. As opposed to August. Uh, yes. The effect of that would have meant that uh, that election would not be conducted by IEBC. But I was in Parliament during that debate, and uh, the people who made that proposal to fail were called members. I'm told, yes, when you look at the answer, you'll see that code, the key code brigade, it is the one which championed uh, the failure of that proposal. So, and, 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 and uh, in private we would ask them why, and they would tell us, no, to us, we prefer the current composition of the commissioners of the 